Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. Also, those of you that are watching and listening on Facebook Live on Facebook.com backslash LiveNowDT, all of it inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios, available to you for local delivery, no delivery charge for Onondaga County, as well as the mobile cafe that will come to your business or your neighborhood, and there are five cafes sprinkled throughout the beautiful, wonderful Hometown of mine, Syracuse, New York. Make sure you get your DT special pumpkin spice chai today. With that being said, we're at this part of the show where I get to have a friend back on, somebody who has connections back to the city of Syracuse, and someone who's picking some talent and taking some names out in western Michigan, and that is Tim Lester, the head coach of the western Michigan Broncos and former offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach of Syracuse. Mr. Lester, how are we doing? I'm doing great. How are you, Dan? Thanks for having me on. I'm doing well, sir. First and foremost, let's talk about uh, navigating through the very strange season that is. You know, it's the spring, it's the fall, it's the I don't know. The ACC says we're playing. The SEC joins the Big 12, the American Athletic Conference. Some conferences say we're going, and teams say no. Some teams say yes when the conferences say no. Big 10 said no and then said yes. Pac-12 said no and then said yes. And then amidst all of this, there's the Mac that you're inside of. What has this whirlwind of college football this year during Corona been like for a head coach? Well, it's, it's been uh, it's been as clear as mud. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I keep telling everybody, wait five minutes and it'll change. And it really does. But we've talked about it for years. You know, you live in the moment. You try to have a great day. And, and if, if, if this world has taught us anything in the last seven months, it's, it's exactly that. You know, you, you do the best you can on that day. You don't know what the next day brings. We were we were on, then we were off, and then we're back on again. And, and uh, it's fun to be back out there again. We're practicing. We're getting ready for our first game in a couple of weeks. And, and uh, it's just trying to live in the moment. It's really the only way to get by. If you start trying to think big picture of what's going to happen in two weeks, uh, you know, you're, it's probably going to not be what you think it's going to be. You know, I, I got, I'm normally a guy that's planned. You know, 14, 14 to 16 months out, you know, if you ask me what's, what's our football team doing next February 10th, I can probably tell you right now I, I'm working on next week. <laughs> you know, I'm playing the next week, and, uh, and it's working. You know, it's different, but it's working, and, and I'm enjoying it. Just being out on the field with the guys is probably the most fun part. Yeah, so, I mean, like you said, this season was on, and then it was off, and now it's back on. Uh, what can you say about, you know, uh, going through all this and navigating this as a coach, thinking, okay, we're going to play in the fall, oh, right now we're, we're going to play in the spring. Oh, no, wait, we're going to play in the fall again. What does that do for your planning and your scheming and everything that you got to get set? It's so hard to do, and I think the biggest part was, is, you know, as, as coaches, as adults, like, we, we handle it better than the players. You know, they're in their moment. This is their time. This is their time that can add value and, and have the time of their lives, and, and it's been taken away. It's been given. It's been taken away. And, and so I really think now more than ever, you know, your relationship with your players and being able to talk them through the ups and the downs of, of the emotional roller coaster that's, that's in front of them right now uh, has really, you know, benefited us in, in having open and honest conversations through the good ones and the bad ones and, and you know, guys that are like, you know, ready to go to the league and are they going to play? They don't know if they want to play in the spring and now they're all back playing because we get to play in the fall. So uh, I think those conversations and, and running the program the right way with the relationship with their players has really been beneficial because our guys are, you know, our guys are the first guys that came out with a statement, which I didn't know they were doing about we want to play. And I think that another team did it, that another team did it. And it kind of forced our athletic directors and um, presidents back to the table to talk about it. And then and, and boom, we're back on. So I give them a ton of credit. And they've been showing up for about two, two and a half weeks now practicing, and, and it's been, it's felt good the last couple of weeks. It's kind of normal, but uh, still on the door, he's ready for the next thing to change. Hey, coming from Tim Lester here this morning on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. Like you said, uh, your players were the first to the table to say, hey, we need to change that. We need to do something about this. We want to play. We want to be out there. Uh, what, what can you say to that, that the MAC was so uh, adamant about it in front runners? Uh, obviously, Justin Fields, the Ohio State quarterback, got a lot of credit for putting out his petition directly uh, at the Big Ten that had over 200,000 signatures. Uh, what can you say? I mean, we, we see how Justin Fields, uh, what that did and, and, what, and what that brought to it. 
uh, knowing that, you know, in the state of Ohio, obviously, you know, the, the MAC is, is throughout that region and, and in the Midwest and whatnot. So what can you say to, obviously, what Justin Fields did, but also the fact that, like you said, the MAC was the first to the table to say, hey, we want to play. We need to look at this again. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was the thought it was funny. I was in a, I was in a meeting and I got sent a graphic from one of my seniors. Uh, my left guard, he's a four year starter, going to be a doctor, extremely intelligent, and, and I thought he was kind of sending me a, a, a graphic with a statement from our team. And I thought it was like, "Hey, coach, check this out. Like, will you look at this for me?" And little did I know, it was already out. He was just sending it to me first. Uh, but by the end of the meeting, it was all over social media. And, and uh, a lot of the people at our meeting, our athletic director, got it. And it was all happening while we were in an athletic department meeting. And, uh, you know, it was it was well written. It was well thought out. And it, it's important for people to know uh, that they have a voice, you know. And, and uh, you know, nothing had come. I know Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields, they had a chance to come out and let everyone know that they're excited and they have faith in their universities and, and the decisions that they make and that we can make it safe and other people are making it safe. And, uh, you know, having... And our, our, we got together, a lot had changed, testing had changed, um, you know, so it was good that, that they they got out in front of it and made their, their opinions known of what they wanted to have happen. And, and the league did a great job of responding, and we had very important meetings with the, with the commissioner, and then the players met with the commissioner, and our, I thought our league did a great job of going through the process that everyone had say in, in turning this thing back on, and uh, now we're, we're in the midst of it now. So the Mac is back. I had one of my friends say to me, he's like, man, he's like, I miss, I miss like Tuesday nights, you know, like the Mac will play on any day. They'll play on Tuesday, Wednesday, it doesn't matter. You know, he was like, I really just miss, miss seeing the Mac. What does that mean to you that there's people out there going, hey, you know, I, I love, I love that, you know, it's not just Saturdays or Friday nights, like the Mac will play whenever, whenever they can get out there, get on television, get in front of some people. What does it mean to you that, you know, People wanted to have that Mac attack back. It, it's, it's huge. I mean, it's people want football every day, and, and give a lot of credit for or for the for the NBA and Major League Baseball and NHL and and now college football of making 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 it happen. And, and people people wanted it. People the, from the fans to the coaches to more, most importantly the players, the doctors, and everyone. It took a definitely took a village to get it back. And, uh, and it was, it was fun because this match is coming back. I mean, our first game's on a Wednesday night. Our first three games, I think, are on Wednesday night. So uh, it's going to be coming soon. And, and the more football we've been watching it on the weekends. And I know there's been games postponed for the safety, which is the most important thing. And, uh, but for every two games canceled, there's there's 40-some games played. You know, and those those 80 teams get to play a game, and unfortunately they have to reschedule some, and I'm sure that's going to continue to happen, and, and for the right reasons, uh, but the guys that are, the teams that are healthy are able to, to do what they love to do. And, you know, and, and for you in, in the Mid-American, uh, speaking here with Tim Lester, a Western Michigan Broncos head coach, uh, you know, to, to look at this, I mean, the Akron Zips, Bowling Green Falcons, the Buffalo Bulls, Penn State, Golden Flashes, Miami of Ohio, Red Hawks, the Ohio Bobcats, Ball State Cardinals, Central Michigan Chippewas, Eastern Michigan Eagles, Northern Illinois Huskies, the Toledo Rockets, and, and you, the Western Michigan Broncos. To see this all back at it, I'm looking at the schedule right now. Uh, you have the Akron Zips. You'll be playing up against Toledo uh, in your second game, then Central Michigan, then Northern Illinois. Then you'll have uh, Eastern Michigan. You'll end the, uh, the regular season against Ball State. Six games bring me into the schedule. You know, normally you're playing 12, so it's half of the season, but it's still a season. What can you say about, you know, looking at the schedule and what you have ahead of you? Well, we're excited. I mean, obviously the biggest games of the year for us are our five divisional games, and instead of three crossovers, we're only going to get one. Uh, we'll be in week one, and we, we get to go down to Akron. So, uh, you know, those are the big games. Those are the ones that decide who gets to go to the MAC championship game, and, and it's always nice to have the warm-up games and to play the non-conference games. Obviously, we're supposed to play Syracuse this year. We're supposed to play Notre Dame this year. Uh, so we, we miss out on some of those, but the, you know, our goal at the beginning of the year is to win a MAC championship, and, and that's still a lot. And uh, some of the other things aren't alive anymore, but the main goal is still there. And uh, you know, I mean, you have to find a way to be ready to go. You know, you, you can't have your first game, you know, look like uh, like game one. 
you know, so we've, I've been on the phone with a ton of coaches that have had to deal with the same stuff we're dealing with and how did they get to the point to get their team ready to play. And, and so we, we definitely, this training camp is different than any training camp we've ever had. And obviously with the testing going on and with school be going on during training camp, it's, everything is different. And our team has responded. They've been doing a good job. And, and you know, we've, we've been trying to get ready for game one, knowing that we need to be in midseason for it because we're, the first game one's a conference game. And, uh, and that puts a lot of pressure on us, and, and we're, we're happy to, to have a chance to play in a, in a conference game at all. So, uh, so we've been we've been hitting. We've been you know it's important that we do think we've done more live football than we ever have done before because we have to make sure that we we get the bumps and bruises out and we're we're ready to play come come week one. We still got about three weeks to go, but I, I really like where our team's at. You know, and, and for you to kind of get everything get to, together and. You know, being off, being on, you know, being on, you know, this back and forth and whatnot. How have you, as a as a coach, tried to make sure that the guys had the playbook, knew what they needed to know, that you know what you need to know about, you know, your depth chart and, and putting everybody together? Bring me into that of of your preparation as a coach because things have been so fluid. How have you implemented your game plan and, and how have you tried to assess your depth chart with a few weeks to go? Yeah, and that's probably the most unique thing. Well, two, two things that are the most unique about that, well, the two from a football perspective is, number one, because of all the virtual meetings and everything they've allowed us to do over the summertime, uh, we are we started our first day of training camp with everything installed already. We had gone through it. We threw it in the summer once and then again in the summer, and then we started having more through since July when we were here to go to uh, Right before we started training camp, uh, we – we got canceled, and then we were still able to do some things together and keep the install going. So it's really unique to have practice one with everything in. I mean, we had done tight red zone. We had done two-minute drill. We had done, like, everyone knows everything. So it's made for a really cool uh, training camp as far as being able to get right in and start playing uh, because everything, because of the meetings and the amount of meetings they gave us, uh, we're ready to go mentally. It's the physical part and the repetition part that we're trying to catch up on. And we've n- never been in a training camp where you have players at different conditioning levels, you know. And normally, when you when your strength coach hands you a team by by the end of the summer, I mean, everyone's in shape. Uh, and and it wasn't the same this year. Some guys were in shape, some guys weren't in shape. And, and so we've been, you know, thank God for we have these you know GPS units that we use on our players that help us scientifically understand who's in shape, who's not in shape. We've shortened practices. We have certain longer practices to get them in shape because we have to get them in shape while playing football, which is rarity. You know, normally when, when you get them, they're ready. And uh, so we've had to make some adjustments, but the repetition is key. And getting the guys the reps that they need, getting the young kids reps that they need. The young kids have an advantage because they should know what's going on with all these virtual meetings. Uh, they just have to, have to play enough to get the game to slow down. So, um, so it has been. It's been a challenge. It's been exciting. Uh, some of the freshmen are closer to playing than they've ever been because they know what's going on. They've been in meetings since June. Uh, we've we've done so many installs. Less time on the field, more time in the meeting room. So they know what's going on. We just need to get them in shape and, and get them the reps that they need uh, to be ready to go and play and help us. That coming from the man, Tim Lester, this morning on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of the Cafe Kubal studios, uh, former Syracuse offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach and uh, current head coach of the Western Michigan Broncos. You were, as you alluded to, had the opportunity uh, in a regular season, you were supposed to be playing Syracuse as one of your non-conference games. Uh, you have played up against Syracuse, did it last season uh, in Syracuse, and in that game 52-33 to on the side of Syracuse. As a former quarterback, as a quarterback's coach, as a man who knows the position and knows it well, and as a man who brought in Eric Dungy to Syracuse, what can you tell me about being on the other side as a head coach and what do you see on film from Tommy DeVito, who you know obviously is going through an injury right now, but there's there's been some issues with you know what what I see to be his vision on the field, uh, kind of dropping back and already de- already deciding where he was going to go to. Uh, timing hasn't been down and whatnot. You have been able to obviously uh, try and scheme against him and prepare as the coach on the other side. What do you see from Tommy DeVito on film? Yeah, you know the biggest thing with him is just the, and I haven't, I haven't got to watch him a ton this year. 
Uh, we knew going into the game last year, and uh, fortunately for us, we were we threw a brand new defense in, and, and I, we gave up 50 in two of our first four games. And by the end of the year, we were uh, one of our top defenses in the in our league, you know. And, and so we, we knew that with that system, Coach Coach Babers has an unbelievable system, and, and, and all the checks that they make you make, and they got us a couple times. He really beat us with his feet. You know, we were trying to get, we we're going to try to take away his first or second read and make him go through a progression. And we thought that was the thing that was going to give us an advantage. And he did. He got always ran. He had two or three big runs against us, made a couple big throws. Um, and that's always the hardest thing with, with the offensive system, you know, is, is trying to figure out, you know, with all the difference, with the speed that it's happening, um, you know, that they, they're a timing based, speed based team. And when they're clicking, they're really, really hard to beat. And, and that was the one thing we were going to struggle with with him. He young defense is being able to keep up with the pace and let him have his first read a couple times. And, and, that, and that's when you really got, that's when we got behind the eight ball. We got to the point, I think it was in the fourth quarter, we were down seven with the ball, drove down, and offensively we, we, couldn't, we couldn't tie the game. You know, and that was a great opportunity to get to that situation. And I think they scored one late. But, uh, you know, we had to get him to get to make him go through a progression. And I know with this time off, a timing offense, I've seen a lot of those wide open spread offenses that, you know, they haven't had the amount of reps that they need to get the timing down uh, when you're playing that fast. You have to all be in, in rhythm. And I saw Eric have that rhythm when we played him when Eric was still in, in uh, and they had the whole summer and the whole training camp to get ready. So I know it's been difficult on those offenses. They really watched, uh, you know, the – the Mike Leach offense the first week, the unstoppable. They had their rhythm going, and then they struggled the next week. I think they only scored two last week. So with that offense, there's so much timing. You just need to be out there practicing, and that's one thing we haven't gotten. Uh, and that's what we're trying to catch up on as much as possible. We're trying to keep their legs fresh and get a lot of ton of reps, and that's a very fine line. And It's been uh, it's been harder on those teams that, uh, that haven't had the practice because you have to all be on point when you're going that fast. And if you face a defense that can keep up with you mentally, then they can still force the quarterback to have to go through a progression, and that's hard for any quarterback. As a former quarterback and, and as somebody who knows the position very well, going back and looking at the film of Tommy from, from the game last season and just watching him in general, uh, speaking on Tommy DeVito, from a quarterback to a quarterback, how would you describe his strengths and weaknesses? What do you see on the film from an analytical standpoint? Well, I think he's got a great arm. He's got plenty of arm strength. Seems to be very accurate. Um, he's got better feet, I think, than people think. Uh, and then, and, and at that point, it, it makes him no different than any other quarterback because he needs to he needs to mature in the position to go through a progression and get to three and four consistently and make sure that all the fans at home don't even know that he just got to his third or fourth read. Uh, in fact, we just got off the practice field. And my guy got to his fourth read today on one. It was the biggest play of the game. Or a scrimmage that we were going through and checked down and, and, and second and 15 and got us to third and one because he found his back. And uh, and that's really the maturation process. And like I said, I haven't seen him play this year. And that, that was the one thing we wanted to make him do. And, uh, you know, and unfortunately, we didn't get the job done. They went so fast that Melissa Moon, he made some great throws to his first read in his progression every time because we knew, we knew he could do that. And he did it and, and used his feet to beat us a couple times. And, um, you know, and that's going to be the biggest part of any quarterbacks is, is the progression from year one to year two to year three. You know, I was a four-year starter and was terrible my first year. I got better my second year. And once the game slows down, it's easier to get to those progressions. And some guys mature through that. Some guys don't. And uh, and that's, like I said, I haven't seen him play this year. But that was the point when we played him last year. We wanted to try to force him to do that. And we, we didn't get the job done. There were too many too many first, first options you know, coverages where he got man coverage and was able to get rid of it quick. And, and we know he can put it on point when he, when he gets there. And, and that's the, and I don't know their offense and I don't know the ins and outs. So, uh, but as he gets to that point, he, he needs to be able to get through that progression to have success, especially success, especially at that level. How quickly should a quarterback, in your opinion, be able to survey the field and have his vision and, and check all these reads? And like you said, people not at, people at home to not know that he's going to his third option or his fourth option, whatever it may be. How quickly does a quarterback have to see the field? You know, it, it, and every guy's a little bit different, and a lot of it comes down to how well they they progress and how much film they watch, you know, who kind of crazy anal they are about getting 
need to know the defense they're playing uh, because there, there's a thing in quarterback called elimination. So when you get up there and you see the coverage and you you pretty much, before you even take the ball in your hand, you're like, okay, one's not going to be there by this coverage. I'll take a peek at two. It probably doesn't have a good shot, and I'm going to get to three and four. And all of a sudden he draws back, he peeks two, it's not there. He goes to three, four, and it's thrown on time to a fourth receiver in a progression because he was able to eliminate one and probably eliminate two as well by leverage because he did so much film study that he didn't have to waste his time looking at one and looking at two. By the time you get to three, if you didn't eliminate anybody, you're probably fat or scrambling and running for your life. So that that's, uh, that's really the point where I see those guys that are really – Really, really into it and really, really into the film study. Uh, you know, David Blau, my quarterback at uh, Purdue, was unbelievable at that. And, and obviously he's playing in the league now and doing a good job. And, uh, you know, he, he was just, he was like a coach, you know, and, and that was what helped him develop his, his, through his college career. And then there's other guys that, that don't progress. And then they normally you have the young kid that comes in and beats them, beats them out. You know, you got to give him a chance at some point. So, uh, you know, that's the development, that's the focus for these quarterbacks. You know, I have a, a true, I have a young quarterback playing this year. Um, he's his third year in the program. He played as a true freshman when our starter got hurt. Played okay. Registered last year when my quarterback was a senior. And so he's in his third year, but his first year starting. And that's all I've been talking to him about. We spent a ton of COVID virtual hours watching film together and asking him, what do you see? What would you eliminate on this play? Where do you think you'd go on this play? And then we'd watch the play come out. And if, if you can get a guy that's that committed, uh, then they can they can build themselves to be a great quarterback. You know, and that's that's the but that's the progression that has to happen. It's not physical; it's a mental and a studying thing to make sure that you continue to develop as you get to be a sophomore, junior, senior in college. Speaking here with Tim Lester this morning on on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. When a quarterback is not progressing. Or when we're not seeing, you know, these these steps in the right direction, how much do you put it on a quarterback coach? How much do you put it on the the offense maybe not fitting the quarterback? How much do you put it on them? You know, with you having to go through the progression as a player, and then you having to coach that, you know, as a quarterback's coach and now as a head coach, uh, how much do you put on the coaching staff? How much do you put on a player? How much do you put on the scheme when things aren't working? Yeah, it's hard because you know the. I mean, the scheme's been developed over years, and the scheme works. There's, there's nothing with that. But there, there's so many factors that I think that's the key with quarterback coaches. You see, so many great quarterback coaches that play the position that understand offensive line matters a ton. You know, yeah. uh, your receivers matter a ton. Uh, your running game matters a ton, and so there's so many factors. You know, I always obviously there's we're in the world of, of quarterbacks leaving and going to other places and, and, and a lot of position players leaving and going to other places. And I always talk to them about making sure they find the place. You know, like a receiver that wants to go somewhere, sometimes you're like, hey, make sure you go to a place that can run the ball, that has a quarterback that's played. It doesn't matter how good you are, if you're not surrounded with the players that you need, you're, it's going to be really hard for you to have success. And so so there's just, you got to you got to figure out what the factors are and make sure that the quarterback is aware of those factors. Like, hey, our old line, I love talking to our backup quarterbacks when they're in there with our backup offensive line against the one defense because it's the greatest teaching tool ever. It's like, hey, you not only have to do your job, but you have to do it faster than ever before because you know we're not going to hold up long up there, you know? And I haven't seen the O-line play, and I haven't seen the receivers. I haven't watched one Syracuse game, so I don't know where they're at. But but there are a lot of factors in there that, uh, once again, I think communication is key. The, the quarterback has to know what his strengths and weaknesses are. And, yes, coaches can call games around their, around their personnel. You know, when you have a good running game, when you don't have a good running game, when you have a stoked receiver, and can you, can you find ways to get that guy the ball? So th- those are where I think the coaches, you know, really can earn their money when they know how to make tweaks in their offense to hopefully cover up the weaknesses of the players. Uh, the quarterback, let's be honest, the quarterback can't be weak. He can't be. He has to be great. And then, but you can, a great quarterback can make uh, average receiver is better if your if your own line's average. You can seven man protect or make sure you're get you know calling the things and that can get rid of the ball quicker. So all those little adjustments. I mean, we had a really unique year my last year at Syracuse only because you know we took over and we were at 120th I think in the country in offense. And our goal was to get to 60. To cut it in half, and we knew we had a young quarterback, we had a young offense.
offensive line, and we had a lot of we, we knew the the strengths and, and weaknesses of our of our team. So you know, and we were able to cut it in half, which is great. Um, but it, it had to be a, a calculated approach. Uh, what things within our offensive scheme uh, work with our O line, and which ones work with our receivers, and and so that's that's where the coaches can have a sense once they're honest about where the real issues are, if it's at wide out, if it's at the running game, if it's the O line. So once you figure those things out, then you have to then change your offense and call certain plays maybe more than you normally do so that you're putting your players right, wrong, or different, whether they're all ACC players or not. Uh, you have to try to get them in the best position for success on Saturday. And in a couple of years, I knew Eric was going to be unbelievable. And, and a couple of those other young offensive linemen were going to be unbelievable. But at that point, they weren't. And uh, so you have to call a game, you know, to give yourself the best chance to win on that Saturday. And someday you can just line up and throw your normal offense out there and you'll have the players to do it. But that really happens in the first three or four years of a of a coach's opportunity somewhere. Uh, so in the meantime, you got to find ways to, to win games and be in games. And um, and that it was fun to watch that what, four or five years after we finished that class and won 10 games. I was rooting. So it was, it was fun to watch that year. Because that was that was the team that's really hit me. These guys are going to be pretty darn good in their way. And I, and I was happy for those guys that year. Eric Dungey, you recruited him. You are responsible for that. You said, Scott, you know, speaking on Scott Schaefer, keep that spot, you know, keep the spot open for my guy. Uh, you and I talked about him uh, kind of, you know, like under the wraps. You're like, hey, yeah, I remember talking to you. I remember the parking lot I was in on the phone with you when you were like, hey, I got this guy, Eric Dungey. you got to see the film on him. Love this guy. you got to check him out. Got to check out the film. Danny's going to be good. Like, I remember the conversation we had about that when you're like, you know, and you're flying out to Oregon every single, you know, legal NCAA chance you got. You brought him in, okay? You, d you did it. So I say to people all the time, 10-3 and three season, thank Tim Lester. You like Eric Dungy? Thank Tim Lester. I mean, you bonded with that family. You gave them, you gave them uh, a sense of a security blanket for him to come from the West Coast to the East Coast. I told fans over and over and over again in his last season, Love him while he's here. You're going to miss him when he's gone. Don't make the mistake of not appreciating him until it's too late. But fans did. Not everybody, but some did. And I got messages last year like crazy. Oh, my God, Dan, we miss him. What's, you know, what can we do without him? He should be on the Mount Rushmore of Syracuse quarterbacks. You know, does he have another year of eligibility? We were wrong. And, how, and I said, listen, I told you guys what to do. You didn't listen to me. You didn't heed the call. Not everybody did. What can you say about the Eric Dungey factor? First and foremost, I know you're a humble guy, but I give all the credit in the world to you because you stayed on this man and you brought him to Syracuse, and he brought Syracuse a lot of big-time moments that they hadn't seen in 19 years, 17 years, 20 years when it came to the wins that they had and everything that they did. So kudos to you for bringing in Eric Dungey. And what can you say about the fact that people really didn't appreciate it and now – I'm getting, all I hear for the last two years is, God, I wish Dungey was here. Well, he is a special kid and a special player, and most special players are special people. You know, and, and when we were looking for a quarterback, and I was looking all over the country for one, and then and, and Chief was thinking about taking one, and, and, and once once I hit it off with Eric, I, 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 I was pretty darn sure we had something special. And, and he was tough, and he was still skinny, and he was going to grow into his beauty. And I knew he was going to put the time and effort in. And, and I actually told him when we got let go, I mean, I brought him in and sat down. And I know Dino's offense, and it's fantastic for a guy like him. I mean, he fit it perfectly. And I said, hey, this is going to be great for you. Here comes a guy that runs a high-tempo, fast offense. Athletic quarterbacks can only make it better. I was like, you need to learn it. You, you have a chance to put up phenomenal numbers here, you know. And uh and trying to try to build him up to keep his confidence up. Because when you recruit a kid and you coach a kid, you care about the kid, where, whether you're coaching him or not, you know. And, I mean, he was in a room last year in the dome hanging out before the game, you know. And uh, it was great to see him, and, and we got to sit down and talk a little bit. And, and so, uh, so yeah, it was it was a – it was a special time and a special kid, and, and we, we went against him and, you know, we tried to tackle him, and he ran over us, and it was funny. He kept say, running by the sideline and saying something to me and laughing, and uh, he's such a competitor. And, and like I said, you know, in all offenses, but especially that offense, I mean, you need to have a great quarterback. 
great. Not good. Great. And if you have a great one, uh, there's nothing that can stop you. And, uh, and, and, and they had a great one. And I, I you know, I was funny because we heard, we played them a couple of years ago. We heard, I read some articles about, you know, is Dungeon going to get beat out? And I, I didn't read one of them. I, I didn't read a one of them because there was no way that was going to happen. One, if you know the person. Two, if you know quarterback play, Eric was playing, period, the end. And, uh, and so, you know, anytime you turn quarterbacks over, it's really, really difficult, especially when you're coming from a guy that can do so many things. His legs do that for a lot of things. Yeah. And, 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 and he was special, and people don't give, give him enough credit for that part of, of, um, of being able to make a bad play into a good play. You know, there's so many things about offense that you have to have positive plays. And he made some plays that probably would have been sacks, turned them into uh, second and fives, second and eights, instead of second and fifteens. And, and, and he knew it. And he knew what he brought to the table. And, and he took some hits, unfortunately. And I did everything in my power. He could have ice punch. I didn't stop jumping over people. Uh, and, and he didn't want to listen. He flipped. I mean, he got flipped on his head a couple times in high school. You know, on the third and 18, he went for a 10 yard run. And he was eight yards short. And he still jumped over the guy. And, um, but that was the heart of the kid, you know, and so, so it was great. I'm glad Chase let me take him, and 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 he obviously came in. And I knew once when they hired Dino, I knew that, that fit was going to be great uh, for what they were going to do, and, and some of the young wideouts they had around them, and then even the guys that transferred in, and and uh, I, I knew they had a chance to be special. And uh, it was fun to watch him have his year, and we did we continue to communicate today. And, uh, but finding these kids is hard, you know, and, and you got to know what you're looking for, and, and you don't find them all the time. There's years there just isn't one out there, you know. And uh, so when you find them, you got to you got to get them, you know, because they they don't they don't just come along. I think everyone knows they don't just come along. And the coaches and the coordinators and the system gets a lot of credit when you have a guy like that. And uh, and then you don't have them, and then, then all the pressure's on, you know, and that's and that's happens everywhere, not just there, everywhere. And um, you know, we're doing it right now. We had a great quarterback last year, and, and now we got to prove that we can we can get the next one ready to go. And that's hard to do when you had a, have a one like one like him. You're, there's going to be a drop off for sure. Can you lean on your run game more? Can what can you do until you get this next guy oiled up uh, to be ready to be nearly as good as as Eric? And that's really hard. To it is, you know, he was the super glue to the broken play. And, you know, I, I think I think people know it now if they didn't know it before. Uh, Tim, in closing here, before I let you go, uh, how different, like you said, uh, Dino's offense, it fit Eric. But obviously, you know, there's different quarterbacks. I see Tommy more of like, stay, you know, more of a slow, get in the huddle, a, a slow, you know, slow pace kind of methodical type of quarterback, a pro-style quarterback that's maybe a square peg round hole uh, situation right now. What can you say about the offense as far as what you were running at Syracuse? How different is Dino Baber's offense? And are there any parallels to what you had, you know, just what you can say offensively to kind of go into it? Because they, they you know, stamped it orange as the new fast. And obviously it, it doesn't look like that without uh, Eric Dungy. So, how different is the offense to what you were running at Syracuse, and how would you describe it? I mean, we were we were much more West Coast, you know, uh, than we were much more like I'm trying to think of a team, an NFL version. Uh, we were much more like what you see, probably the the Rams, you know, and I'd say a little bit Kansas City. You know, no one really truly, other than maybe the Cardinals over there in Arizona, that runs the true air raid fast Baylor. Um, so it, a lot of the concepts are the same. The speed is the key, and and when you have speed like that, uh, the processing power of the quarterback has to be phenomenal. And if you have a, a quarterback that can process and move his feet, uh, like a De'Ara King, uh, which I've always loved him in Houston, because he can process, he can play fast, he had his feet to even bail him out if he if he pre. You know, my guy, I like having my quarterback at the line of scrimmage, and I like to have 15 to 20, 30 seconds to look at the defense and try to maneuver the defense, move the defense, figure out what they're in, put a plan together and attack it. So uh, I would say that uh, the major difference between a true air raid and the West Coast is really just tempo. They're doing a lot of the same things, 
uh, on the quarterback won't have as much pressure on him uh, when he has more time. You know, time is everything uh, at the line of scrimmage. And every split second, every false step that a defender makes that gives you information on what they're about to do is huge. And, and, and it's the, the air raid is just faster. I mean, really fast. And, uh, and if you can, if your guy can process that fast and your team can process that fast, your whole line can process that fast, then, then you can have, you can have a lot of success with it. And you gotta have that, that right guy. You know, whereas I think the West Coast, you rely on the run game a little bit. Uh, we always felt like, you know, being in the ACC and at that point not having the best talent in the ACC that, that we had to run the ball, we had to control the clock, we had to get in the fourth quarter in a close game. Um, and so we, we were running very similar, but just not nearly as fast. And hopefully, yeah, we went back in a little bit more time at the line of scrimmage. And we wanted to take pressure off the board. Uh, and, and that's one thing about the, the air raid, that the West Coast, you know, you guys, like, if you have a running game, which a lot of them do, uh, it takes a ton of pressure off these quarterbacks, you know. And uh, and when you don't have a great running game, uh, then and the air raid, there's some teams that run it well in the air raid, not a ton. Uh, it's all it's all in the quarterback. I mean, there's no other way. It's it's you get to snap the ball and it's yours because you're gonna throw it 70 times. And if you play well, we win. If you don't play well, we lose. Um, and that's hard to do that on Saturday every single Saturday. So um, you know that's probably the biggest thing is, is relying on the run game and being able to. Now the great thing is you have a dome, so at home games you never got to worry about weather. You can you can run that that wide open fast. I love it, and it's a great place to do it. Um, but the run the run game part is just something else. As a quarterback guy, I'm always trying to find ways to make it easier because we all know it's the hardest position out there. You're always trying to find every edge to make it a little bit easier, and, and that's one thing that that our offense. You know, we played Clemson that year. Uh, Eric was hurt, and we rushed for like 250, and we hung in there. We lost by seven or ten, or but it was a year they won the whole thing. But was, we got the run game going, and that took a lot of pressure off Mahoney, and uh, and it, it gave us a chance to stay in the game. And, and so that's the the versatility, I think, of, of a West Coast offense is something that can help a quarterback, whereas the the, the wide-open West Coast, I mean, you can score 80, 90 points, which is fun to watch, uh, but that, that guy with the, tri- the trigger man has got to be on because it's, it's going to be on him every time. So it's good and bad with both. Um, I've been a chance. I've had a chance to coach both, which is kind of fun. Um, but I'm obviously a quarterback guy, so I, I love to run the ball and to take pressure off of him. He's going to have to make plays regardless. I just don't need him to make 70 plays. I'm hoping 35 to 40 is enough. It's coming from Tim Lester. Makes a lot of sense, and I love the analysis of it all. really gives us a lot. How much do you know about Rex Culpepper and you know what he can potentially be to this team? Well, the one thing about Rex that I always thought was unique in, in recruiting him, and I, I didn't finish recruiting while well, I started the process, didn't finish, was is the is his running ability, you know, kind of like a Tebow. I always thought of him like a big, strong, physical, uh, where you could you could alter your offense a little bit uh, and, and do some things with him in the running game, you know. And, and I never got to be around him in the processing. I never got to coach him. I never got to see how smart he is. I never got to see him go through a progression or adjust to a rolled coverage. I, I didn't get to see any of that because uh, I never got to coach him. But in looking at him early on, uh, you know, every guy has different strengths. And, and I just thought with his body, his strength, his size, his speed, uh, there's some things that – that we could do with him, you know, because of the athletic ability, um, that that would that would make it hard, you know, because all of a sudden we, we really didn't want Eric much. We didn't want it on Eric. We ran when we had to. Uh, and I thought we could do the same thing with uh, with Wax. He was a smart kid, never got up. I think he got one. I think never got a beat in his life. I think it was his sister or brother that got one beat. Everyone in the family never got a beat in their life. And uh, and so I knew he was serious about it and was going to focus on it and uh but that's where i i felt i never got to see it because i never got to work with them but i was really looking forward to seeing what kind of things we could do and and i was going to watch a bunch of tebow film and watch some of the things he did because florida did a lot of good stuff with him because he had ability to take some hits and keep getting up when you're that big and that strong and uh and i felt Derek would get there eventually too i coached him at 185 not 220 220 uh but uh, but I really felt Rex had a chance to do that. But I haven't, you know, I haven't really. I said hi to him, and you know, before the game, and he looks great. But uh, I haven't had a chance to really watch 
of where he's at as a quarterback right now. Yeah, coming from Tim Lester, uh, Tim, last thing here, Western Michigan, you got three seasons there, six and six, seven and six, and seven and six as well. Two bowl games in three years at your alma mater. This is your fourth stint with Western Michigan. What can you tell me about your number four, and what have you learned from the first three? Well, it's been frustrating. I mean, we haven't been able to close out. You know, last year we were, you know, we the last game of the year we had a chance to win it, and we, we didn't play well. You know, I thought uh, the biggest thing we've been trying to build since I got here, I got here, I don't know, a couple, a week or two before the signing date, so the first year of recruiting wasn't really up to, wasn't a great class, and then we really put together a couple good classes together, and watching our defense go from 10th in the league to 2nd in the league last year was huge for us. We're all back. Uh, I really think that's where we needed to build this thing. I think people thought it was crazy coming in as a quarterback coach and an offensive coordinator saying we need to build a defense. Uh, we need to be stout on defense. We need to be able to hold teams down and, and put good players on the defensive side of the ball. And and, uh, and it's happened. You know, the last eight games we've had, our defense has been holding people under 20 points and, and they're all back. And we had an All-American linebacker and uh, we had a couple transfers come in, so I'm, I'm excited to watch our defense play. Offensively, we got everyone back. We just got to replace the quarterback. Got a good running game. Got some really talented wide receivers. I uh, would love to be a young quarterback with this group around them with the defense. So, uh, but that's been the biggest challenge, you know. Is we had to outscore people in the first two years, and and then last year our defense really stepped up and, and kind of grew into their own. And uh, we had a new defensive coordinator last year. Like I said, we gave them 50. I think two of our first four games and. And then by the end, we were holding people at 14, 10, 17. And, and so I'm really excited about this team. You know, if, uh, I think we have a complete team. We have, we, you know, my first year we had all freshmen, snapper, kicker, punter, and now they're all juniors. And so uh, I, I think we're the most complete team we've had. And, and we can win We can win on offense. We can win on defense. Our special team's going to be solid. So uh, it, took, it took a couple years to get to that. We've been playing, trying to support people. And I really think now that uh, we have a chance to get over the hump. We've been one point away two years ago from going to the championship game. One point away last year from going to the championship game. Uh, team scored on the last play to, to, to hold us from going to the championship game. So it's frustrating when you watch two teams play in the championship game that you beat by 17. So both. And uh, and that's and that's our fault. And we need to fix that. And, and it's, a, it's a chip on our shoulder. And, and we're going to go out there and we get another chance to try to fix it this year. That coming from Tim Lester, former Syracuse OC, as well as quarterbacks coach, as well as the current head coach going into year number four with the Western Michigan Broncos of the MAC. Tim, as always, above all things, I appreciate our friendship. Always appreciate your analysis. And I can tell you on my behalf that I miss you like crazy up here in Syracuse. So <laughs> I always look forward to I'm living there. I loved it there. And, and I appreciate you uh, having me on. And I uh, wish you the best, man. We'll talk soon. Absolutely. So do your best out there. Stay safe. And we'll talk soon. Thank you. Take care. That coming once again from Tim Lester in a very, very unique and what I think a, a very, very cool uh, way of approaching this and what's going on with Syracuse football right now is to, you know, be able to see it from somebody who was here, had to implement his offense, had to take up somebody else's offense, take over for that, then implement his offense, you know, be on the recruiting trail and know of Rex Culpepper, who is now the quarterback at Syracuse, to be responsible for bringing in Eric Dungy, for going up against Syracuse as a Western Michigan quarter, uh, Western Michigan coach, to go up against Syracuse in recent history and go up against Tommy DeVito last season. There's a lot of really cool, and to be a quarterback, there's so many layers to this conversation. I hope you go back and listen to it again. Uh, from Tim Lester. Big thanks and a big ups to Tim for being a part of the show today. With that being said, we're going to take our final step aside of the show. When we come back, we'll wrap up today's broadcast on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora and get you set for the weekend. Cafe Cabal Mobile Cafe brings the cafe experience to you. We'll roll out to your neighborhood or office, ready to serve our locally crafted espresso bar to our loyal patrons. Inquire at CaféCubal.com. Café Cubal, coffee for the soul. Welcome back. 
Von Paz Kettle Corn and Pop Corn Factory, located on 201 7th North Street in Liverpool, is home to over 40 flavors with more than 200 flavors in their total wheelhouse. Sky's the limit for this sweet and savory Central New York company. Keep it local at your parties, fundraisers, wedding showers, baby showers, and more by calling 315-450-MA-PA. That's 315-450-6272 for popcorn bars with custom flavors and colors at your upcoming event. Make sure to visit them on 201 7th North Street in Liverpool, New York. And for more information, go to maandpazsnacks.com. Ma and Paz Kettle Corn and Popcorn Factory. How corny are you? The Millhouse Market, located on 3790 New York 13 in Pulaski, New York, is worth the drive every time. Make sure you download their app by searching Millhouse Market on Google Play or Apple App Store. And once you have that, you have their entire menu at your fingertips. You can choose to order now or for later. And then you have their entire menu right there for you. All their sandwiches, all their salads, and their homemade breads, homemade desserts, pizzas, so on and so forth. An incredible, incredible place, which has so many different types of food and styles and flavors and combinations. It's like going to a bunch of different restaurants all in one place. And they say that you can be, you can't be great at everything. You can only be great at one thing or good at a lot of things. That does not apply to the Millhouse Market. Their sandwiches, great. Their concoctions of sandwiches, fantastic. The pizzas, fantastic. The homemade breads and desserts, fantastic. The salads, fantastic. The dressings, fantastic, and so on and so forth. It's all amazing at the Millhouse Market. And they have contactless pay on the app, so you don't have to worry about handing your card to anybody. And they have a drive-up window. You can p- just pick up your food, grab and go while staying in your vehicle. So thank you to the Millhouse Market for helping us to be safe, efficient, and to give us those amazing flavors. There is nothing like being proud to say that the Millhouse Market is in our community. Could have been anywhere, and I'm so glad that it's here. Thank you to Rebecca Elford and her entire team. What a blessing to our community here in Central and Upstate New York. 3790 New York 13 in Pulaski, New York. Worth the drive every time. With that being said, here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, I want to thank my incredible, incredible guests for today's broadcast inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. Cafe Kubal with five locations for you in the community inside of Galasano's Children's Hospital on 3501 James Street, 324 West Water Street, 401 South Salinas Street, right on the way up to the Dome, as well as their newest location on 208 North Townsend Street, the Holly Green Cafe that just expanded their seating inside as the weather's getting cooler so what a fantastic present to the community that they got to do right before it starts to get cold outside thank you so much for that go and get your dt special that's what's in my cup so go get your dt special i'm going and grabbing one today pumpkin spice chai i get mine with almond milk have yours however you'd like it or get any of their other fantastic coffees and drinks and sandwiches the upstate is fantastic and uh, so many great sandwiches and different things to get there. The chocolate chip cookie. I love the upstate sandwich, the chocolate chip cookie, and my pumpkin spice chai. That's the trifecta for me at Cafe Kubal right now. So make sure you go out there and show them some love. You, they also have the mobile cafe and local delivery, which is free. Deliver, no delivery charge to those of you in Onondaga County. Get more information on wakeupcalldt.com by going to the Central New York tab and clicking on Cafe Kubal. Or go to Cafe Kubal. Dot com and their information at Cafe Kubal on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. With that being stated, I want to thank Carvel DeWitt for the annoying moment of the week, which had to do with dating and understanding dating cues. Lead, learn, evolve, ad lib, and deliver. Focusing on today, today on remembering to say thank you and all of the beautiful blessings that we have in our lives. Brought to you by Chick Fil A Cicero with my good friend Juanita Ward, the top dog of the week, which was honoring Kenny Matalolo of Navy football, the head coach there, and Philip Montgomery, the head coach of Tulsa football, honoring them both today with the top dog of the week. Proudly presented by Canine Camp Dog Daycare and Canine Campground Dog Boarding, long and short-term care for your dog, and you know, short and long-term care, I should say, for the daycare and the dog boarding in East Syracuse. And of course, my guy, Tim Lester, offering an analysis from the outside looking in of Syracuse football from somebody who's been a quarterback, who's coached at Syracuse, who's coached the quarterbacks at Syracuse, who brought in Dungy, who was there in the recruitment of 
Rex Culpepper, who was the OC and the quarterback's coach here and now has gone up against Syracuse as a coach for Western Michigan. What a great analysis from him all the way through. And a big shout-out and nothing but the best. The Mac said that they weren't going to go until the spring. Then they changed their mind. They are going now here in the fall. And I'm so ecstatic for their season to start. So God bless and all the good uh, going Tim Lester's way. I hope you have a fantastic season. Finally win the MAC championship and get to do some great things. My love out to you and your family, Tim, to the boys, to your wife, and to the whole family. Uh, God bless each and every single one of you. With that being stated, thank you to Philip Montgomery. Thank you to Tim Lester. Thank you to Kenny Matsalolo. Thank you to Western Michigan, Navy, and Tulsa for helping these conversations to be possible. And thank you to, of course, all of the great companies, including Carvel for the annoying moments, uh, Chick-fil-A Cicero for lead, and Canine Camp Dog Daycare and Canine Campground Dog Boarding for the top dog of the week. Also, a big shout-out to Avacoli's. Use the promo code AVS10 and get 10% off of your online order at myavacolis.com. Of course, to Cafe Kubal, to the Wildcat Sports Pub, where we will be this weekend for our post-game show of Syracuse and Liberty, Honda City of Liverpool, Millhouse Market, Market, uh, Trapper's Pizza Pub, and, uh, of course, Carvel. Love Carvel so much. Got to mention him again. And my and Paz popcorn.com. You go there and use the promo code DT20. That's DT20. You can have it shipped to your house, or you can pick it up on 201 Old 7th North Street in Liverpool, New York. Ma and Paz popcorn. Dot com. Use the promo code DT20 to get 20% off of all of your orders online and for in-store pickup. Make sure you go to monpazpopcorn.com and get 20% off on us. Tune in to Wake Up Call with Dan Satora Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time on Facebook.com backslash LiveNowDT where you're watching and listening on MixLR.com backslash Wake Up Call DT. And, of course, find our audio shows on Stitcher. Tune in. Podbean, iHeartRadio, Spotify, MixLR, iTunes, and Apple Podcasts, and our videos on YouTube.com backslash Wake Up Call DT. That is an archive for you of over a thousand shows on YouTube, on YouTube, over fourteen hundred shows on Podbean, and so many other places to grab it now on iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spotify, TuneIn, and so on and so forth. So make sure you connect with us in all those places and connect with us. Of course, on Facebook at Wake Up Call DT, Twitter at Call DT, and Instagram at Wake Up Call underscore DT on WakeUpCallDT.com. And during the game, you're going to want to connect with us, you know, obviously on that social media, as I will be one of the very few people at the Dome. Big, big thanks to to God, to Syracuse, to hard work and dedication and just love for, for yourself uh, to be able to be there. Uh, big, big thank you. Uh, for that. Uh, Such a monumental thing, and I'm very excited to be at the Dome. So uh, catch me at the Dome on social media. I'll be sending out stuff for Liberty at Syracuse. Uh, The pregame show will be here inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios uh, at 9 a.m. on Saturday, October 17th. So we'll be here at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Then we're going up to the Dome. Then we'll be at the Wildcat Sports Pub after the game for the postgame show. Stay tuned to our social media to find out what time, because that is obviously based on when the game ends, we'll be at the Wildcats. So come out and see us there for the post-game show, 3680 Milton Avenue in Camillus, New York. In the meantime, God bless, no stress, do your best. And remember to smile, to be thankful, and to laugh. Life is great. Celebrate it. Okay? You woke up today. Have a great day.